All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, hope you can all see and hear, and you just uh, tell me if you can't. But uh, yeah, well, let's save the questions until the very end. All right, so welcome to my uh, licentiate defense. Um, uh, it's, it's in kind of uh, weird circumstances, but you know that's that's just the times we live in. <clears throat> so the title of my thesis is the whole story: type-driven synthesis and repair. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of a pun, but it's also because, you know, it's all about these typed holes and, uh, and, and I'm, I, I kinda, a lot of the things I work with are based on how, how we can use these typed holes, um, uh, to, yeah, to, to do, uh, what we want to do. So let, let's just start with that, right? So what is the motivation, right? What are we trying to do? What is the motivation behind this essentially, right? And so uh, the big picture is that, um, you know, when we program, right, and we, we write programs, we, we write a lot of code, right? We, we write a lot of text, and then we, we just compile that text into source programs or, or, or programs that we can run, right? And, uh, and, and in some languages, uh, you know, like, like Haskell, uh, you have type systems. And what type systems allow you to do is that they allow you to kind of give a, a, a specification, a, a small specification of what you want to do to the uh, to the uh, compiler, and then the compiler can actually check that your code. Let me just start the timer. Yeah, then the, the compiler can actually check that your code matches the the spec spec that you made, right? And uh, and some languages even kind of go a bit further than that, and they allow you to, and they 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 can they can infer the type of the code, right? So you don't have to specify what all the code does. You can just kind of partially specify it, and then the rest is inferred, and and some just infer all of it, right? So, and we we have these these types and, and these small specs available, right? But we also have uh, tests, right? People write uh, tests for like how they expect their code to behave. So, um, and in particular, in Haskell, there's a this this. A notion of of these uh, property based testing, right? So, so it's a very popular property based test based framework in Haskell called QuickCheck, and there's a kind of a tradition in the community that you you write these properties along and you ship them along with your code, right? So uh, and the bottom line is that we have these code bases and we have a lot of information in these code bases, right? And, and what I want to do uh, in in this thesis and uh, and, and, and further on in my PhD, is to show how can we kind of make better use of all this information that we already have around uh, to help with development of code, right? And then not just, you know, uh, afterwards. Like, I, I don't want to just compile the code and then run the properties. Uh, I want to be able to use it during development, right? Because So while you're writing the code, I want you to be able to kind of make use of all the information that you uh, provided to the compiler so far, right? Um, and <clears throat> so in Haskell, you have these these type systems, right? And, and the one way that that uh, they that GHC, the the Haskell compiler that, that we uh, mostly use, allows you to kind of interact with the the type environment is to have these typed holes. So what is a typed hole? Well, you 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 write an underscore somewhere in the code, and then you run the compiler, and you get an error, right? And the message looks something like this. It says that it found a hole. It tells you where the hole is, right? Um, so this is in the interactive context, so it doesn't tell you much. It just says that it's in the interactive context. And then it tells you uh, what the type of the hole is, like what is the inferred type of the hole. Um, so I'll, I'll show you better in a demo later on, like how we can interact with it, right? Uh, but so my first uh, my first paper that came out in in, in 2018 at the Haskell Symposium uh, in uh, St. Louis uh, um, was this paper called "Suggesting Valid Hole Fits for Typed Holes." Okay, and what do we do in this paper? Well, in this paper, we we kind of take these holes, and instead of just displaying the type, the inferred type, and the environment, we do some additional work, and we try to figure out based on the type and the environment, what can we put in place of the hole? Right, so uh, let me just show you a demo right away, right? So here, uh, so first of all, I'm gonna turn off the type tools just to show you how it is originally, right? 
So here we, we, we give it a context. We say this is a whole and it should have the type. That's what these double colon means. And it says it should take a list of integers and give you one int, right? And this is the original thing that comes that I showed you earlier. Uh, and if we have some context, let's say if I have, say, let a equals a one, two. So let me make sure this is an int one, two, three in. I can give a context to this and you can see that this this A that's now in the context of the whole, it actually appears in the relevant bindings here. Okay, so let's see if we turn on the valid whole fits. Show valid whole fits. Now, so they're on by default, so uh, that's why I had to turn them off in the beginning. But now we run the code again, and instead of just giving the environment here, uh, we also get the valid whole fits. Now, what are these telling us? Well, they're saying, okay, if you have something of type uh, uh, list of ints to int, you can apply the head function to it, right? And the head function just kind of extracts the first element of the list. Uh, so it's telling, and, and then you, you can apply the length function, which gives you the length of the list. You can find the maximum element, you can take the product of the list and so on, right? So it's telling you, here are the things in scope that you could use in place of the whole and they would work, right? So if we say here, uh, maybe we say head, then, uh, well, it doesn't, it doesn't compile because it's not applied to anything. So if we use head and we use it on the list we had, right? It works. So we can say here that, okay, if I say this is a function that takes in the list and returns a number, uh, it says we can use these functions and we can also use the maximum, right? So we replace the whole with maximum and then it finds the maximum element in the list, right? So these are pretty useful uh, in their own right. But uh, we wanted to take it a bit further and uh, uh, because sometimes, you know, you're trying to write a program and it's not just the single identifier that you need, right? You need more complex expressions like, um, you know, you, you need expressions that are more than one, just one identifier. So for that purpose, I added these uh, refinement levels, right? So what they do is that <clears throat> if you set the refinement level to two, it allows up to two additional holes in the fit, right? Let's just see how that works. Uh, we, we run this again. Well, it takes slightly longer. It's looking at more things. But now we have the original valid whole fits, but now we also have this uh, refinement whole fits, right? And they're telling us, okay, if you give me, so if you replace the whole with the foldl1 function, apply to something of the right type, then the whole type will actually match the type of the whole, right? And, and because we set the refinement level to two, it's saying, okay, if you give me the foldl, if, if you give me the foldl function and you apply it to two things of the right type, so the first thing element has to, the first argument has to be a function from int to int to int, and the second one has to be an int, then it will match the the type of the whole, right? And we can see that, okay, we we do that, and and the cool thing here is that we can kind of use this recursively, right? We can say, okay, foldl, uh, and then we can give it two numbers. And it will look again, and now it's looking for two holes, and then it's saying, okay, you can replace this first hole with something of the type B. Okay, now now the type of the hole is a bit too general. Uh, so let's actually just copy paste exactly what it says, right? We, we have to give the type as well. Uh, so we have to say, okay, I, I'm gonna give you something of type int to int to int, and I'm gonna give you uh, something of type int. Let's see, uh, right here, int. Okay, and then it finds things that work for that, right? So it says for the second hole, well, it doesn't know what to give you, but you could say something like max bound or min bound. Uh, but you can, on I mean, the first hole, you can replace with something like const or, or minus or something like that, right? So we pick something of the right types, okay? And we say, uh, let's give it plus, and let's give it uh, a zero here. And then, you know, it, it works, right? It does the sum of the list. So that's pretty useful, and uh, yeah. So th and the main thought about this was yeah. So now we 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 were kind of just querying the compiler. We're asking it, okay, you so he, you ha already have all the information, right? You know what's in scope, and you know the type of the whole. Just give me things that could work, right? And it allows you to kind of explore more and, and be informed about the environment, right? And when one interesting uh, problem here is um, how do we how do we pick what we what we look at, right? So let me let me go back to to no um, to no valid whole fits, 
uh, not the refinement level. And, and so the idea here is, okay, so how do we how do we pick one of these, right? So one thing that we did is that we we tried to sort them in a nice way. Uh, and, and the way we we sort them here by default is is the size of the type application as we call it. Uh, and it's just saying, okay, like how 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 so it, it's looking at these things like like how how many uh, types do you have to pick to make this work, right? So that's why head and last are first here because you just have to pick one type of, 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 of uh, you just have to say that A is an int. But product is kind of farther away because you have to say, okay, this T here is going to be a list and this A here is going to be an int. So, that, so then we, we, we sort by the size of the, of, the, uh, of the type application as we call it. So let me show you another example, which is it takes in a string and returns a list of strings. Um, and there we have these, uh, you know, this is like a function takes one string, it, it breaks it up into more strings, right? And and the functions in scope are, are lines and words, which is going to pick the lines in the string and the words in the string. But we could also kind of repeat the string again and again, right? And then we just have to set repeat at string, right? But for these two, we don't have to pick anything, so they're closer. Um, but the other way we can also do it is like sorting by subsumption. And what is that? Well, it kind of means, uh, you know, try to sort them so that like the more specialized ones are first and the more generalized ones come after, right? And the idea here is, okay, repeat is is a more general than lines in some sense, right? If you set this A to be a string, well, then, then the type of repeat matches uh, the type of lines, right? And then return is even more general than repeat because uh, le because if you pick the monad M here to be a list and then the, the A here to be a string, it's it's like a more general version of repeat, uh, which is again is a more general version of lines. <clears throat> but this is a bit slower uh, because you have to do pairwise comparison to make this graph, right? Okay, so uh, but so okay, so we now we we kind of we we have this list here, and now we we want to figure out okay, but how can we you know filter it, right? We we ordered it somehow, but how can we filter it more, right? Let's go back to the presentation, right? So. Uh, this is what I said in the paper, right? Uh, uh, can hard be hard to choose which fit to use when multiple fits with the right type of different behaviors are suggested, right? And then the important part is being able to hint to GHC how the function should behave would allow us to discard wrong whole fits. And now at the time, the, the idea that I had was uh, that we use something like the refinement types from, from Liquid Haskell, uh, where uh, you can actually, in the type, specimens, type system, specify these uh, sat clauses. So you can say, you know, the, the type uh, of the function is not just uh, uh, int to bool, it's actually int to uh, bool, and you know that the bool is going to be true whenever x is positive. And then this gets sent to a constraint solver, and, and the constraint solver kind of makes sure that these programs don't type check unless the constraints are satisfied, right? Uh, but you know, this this is not uh, in the in the sense you know like in the original motivation, right? We want to make use of the things that are already there, right? And here we're asking uh, uh, we're asking the user to provide us with more specific types. Right? They'd have to do more work to get some use out of this, right? But what we already have are these properties, right? So as I said, uh, we have these property-based tests in in the Haskell community, right? And and usually you have them already available, um, so so you might you might not specify this type, right? But you might have the uh, the property is positive available, right? So you can kind of specify this sat thing as a property. So uh, that leads me on to the the next paper in this presentation, right? So uh, that's called a proper property based automatic program repair. Uh, and we submitted this uh, last September, and it got accepted to to ICSI uh, as hell this year. Um, and it takes this idea, right, using uh, properties to specify how the programs should work, right? Uh, but you know, because we also, like we said before, we want to make use of what's already there, right? And if you just give a bunch of properties and then try to synthesize the whole program from just the properties, you know, you're not making use of a lot of the the information that's already there. So so we're basing this on automatic program repair, right? So the idea is that you you have a program that's almost correct, right? Uh, and you have some properties about the program that you want to hold. And the idea is uh, uh, you want 
to repair the program so that it satisfies the properties, right? Uh, so to do this, we 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 use the type tools, and and I'll show you in a bit. But yeah, it was joint work with with between me and, and Leonard, uh, and we, we yeah, uh, I, you know, I had a lot of help from from co-authors. So it's not just my work, um, uh, and I want to thank them as well. Okay, but let's look at like how does proper do it? Like what do we do to to use this technique of of trying to repair programs from the information that's already there? So here's an overview. Uh, uh, this is the, the loop that, that the repair process goes through. And it starts off with the source, right? Uh, we start up, up, up here, and, and this is the source code, right, uh, that we have for the program. And this is like the, the GCD, um, the greatest common divisor algorithm. But this program has a bug in it, right? So the bug is, uh, uh, I'll just tell you right away, is that this first line here, okay, instead of returning uh, the B as it should, um, it, it actually loops. It just loops, and, and there's no progress being made here. This is just going to loop over and over again. Um, and we chose this example because this is uh, from another uh, kind of genetic program repair paper. And this is the example they use there, right? So this is a very common example in the program repair community. Okay, so how do we do this program repair? Now, let me walk through you through the, the algorithm. So first, we, we, we find what parts of the program are the properties, right? And how do we do that? Well, first of all, we match the, the we look at the types of the functions in scope. So if they have like a the quick check uh, property type, they're chosen as properties. Uh, but we also look at the names because uh, quick check has this thing where you can say quick check all and it just picks out all the functions that are called prop something, right? Um, so we also just look at the names and we see, okay, if it's called prop something, then we're going to assume it's a property, right? We're going to try and use it as a property. So second, okay, now we, we found the properties, right? But what is the next part? Well, we have to figure out, okay, what what parts of the program are we going to try and repair, right? Because we, we can't just try and, and change the whole program, right? So we, 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 we inspect the bindings of the properties and we find the targets, right? So we look at these props here and we notice that we're using this GCD prime function, right? Uh, which is a function from the same module as the properties are in. Like they're 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 in one of the the modules that are we we're, we're, that are eligible for repair, right? So then we know, okay, we're going to be looking at this GCD prime function and changing that function in order to do this repair, right? That's how we're going to kind of uh, uh, shrink the search space, right? Okay, so then what do we do? Well, we 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 find the failing properties, okay. And in this case, uh, the first property here, uh, it actually it's, it's it's more like a unit test, right? It's just taking taking some input examples and checking what the expected output should be. And this pro first property actually succeeds, right? Because it never hits the zero case. It ends up in the second case here uh, and finishes. Uh, but uh, the second property here, well, it tries GCD prime with zero and some x, and uh, you know it tries GCD prime zero of zero or whatever x, and it's just going to loop again and again. So uh, we we try to so so how do we what do we do next? Well, we try to find the the fault involved expressions, right? So we're not going to just look at the whole program right away. We're actually going to try and figure out okay what you know what should we be focusing on, right? What what are the parts of the program that can be wrong here? And you know the the idea there is. Uh, we use this thing called Haskell program coverage, which allows you to instrument programs and determine what parts of the program are being evaluated. Um, and then by taking this counterexample generated by QuickCheck and then running the property, we can actually find what parts of the functions are being run, right? What 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 expressions in this function are being evaluated, right? And that allows us to determine the fault involved inspections, right? And the idea is, you know, if if it's contributing to a property being false, right, it, it has to be evaluated at some point, right? And those are the things that we can limit it to. Uh, there's some future work that we have, like, to, to do this even better, right? And, and fault localization in general is just a very hard problem to do. But but this is our kind of first first attempt to do it, right? And it works quite well. We actually, in this case, we locate the, the faulty expression, right? So the next thing we do uh, is that we perforate the expressions, right? What does perforate mean? Well, that just means adding holes, right? So we take the the GCD prime zero B here and we replace it with a hole, okay? 
Uh, now, in this example, I'm just showing you the the one that kind of works. Uh, but of course, you know, we 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 replace the whole expression with a whole, and then we also have other versions where we we replace different things with holes, right? So we kind of make different versions of the code that that's filled with different holes. Okay, and then we run GHC and a plugin to generate the candidate fixes, right? So here, this is where the valid hole fits from the first paper come in, right? So we we, we run the valid hole fits uh, synthesis, and for that we get the min bound. But we also we do a little more work where we do things that they generally do in genetic program repair, where we kind of mine the code base uh, for expressions, and then we check, you know, are there expressions in scope of the right type? Uh, and this allows us to pick up like magic constants and literals and stuff like that, uh, w which makes it a lot more uh, uh, useful, right? So we generate these candidate fixes, right? So we get the min bound for just from the type, right? If you set this in a to int, then that this matches the constraint. It works. Uh, we get all these ints from scope, uh, but crucially, uh, in this uh, hole, b is in scope, right? It's it's an argument to the function, and because it's this this uh, hole is located at the right hand side of this definition, this b is an int that is in scope. So that will be a a, a valid hole fit, right? So that's suggested. Okay, and then we do a candidate evaluation. So then we take all the candidates. Okay, we 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 replace uh, we replace the uh, the holes with those candidates, right? And then we run the evaluation again, which means we run the tests again, right? And we check, okay, did this candidate fix the tests or not? Uh, and so we replace this hole here with one of these candidates, a B in this case. And uh, of course, this is the right solution. So uh, it, it works and then it satisfies all the properties. And then in the end, we generate this fix, right? We generate... Uh, a kind of a diff saying, okay, you should remove this line and replace the line with uh, with just the B, right? So I'm going to show you quickly how it works. Uh, uh, so let's see. So here we have the broken GCD function, right? We have the properties that we looked at, and we just have some unrelated function here. And now we're going to run this. Uh, I prepared a, a, a config for this to make it quick and we say examples a uh, broken gcd and now first it starts describing the problem that it's it's like pre-computing some valid hole fits and it's it doesn't it doesn't work in describing the problem and this takes about five seconds and then it starts running right and it, it runs a genetic search but in this case it doesn't actually have to do any genetic search because the repair is actually just there right y you can just find it immediately saying if you replace this with a b then it works and then we get this diff that we showed you, right? And it's in, you know, it happens quite quickly. Uh, and and what it's doing here is that it's really a, because you know it it doesn't just it doesn't just fail the property, right? What it what happens is that it goes into an infinite loop, and of course that's treated as a failure, right? You don't satisfy the property if you don't finish, right? So then then we 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 have some instrumentation to say, okay, if you if you run too long with just a timeout, then then we treat that as a false property. And, and by, yeah, uh, so we managed to actually fix the code, right? And this is the right solution. That's quite nice. Uh, but of course, uh, we don't really show off the genetic repair here. So we have another uh, function uh, problem here, which is called three fixes. And here we have this broken pair. So it says one, two, three, but then we have a bunch of properties, which essentially boil down to saying, uh, you know, the first part of this tuple should be three, the second one should be four, and the third one should be five, right? So this should be three, four, five. Uh, and then we just run the program again on the three fixes. And, you know, it starts off by describing the problem. That takes some time. Um, and then, you know, I, it, it will eventually start the genetic search. And here we can see that it actually, it's actually doing some genetic search, right? It, it has multiple fixes and it's kind of breeding together the fixes that work well with some randomness as well. And in the end, you know, within 102 generations, uh, we find something that actually satisfies all the properties, right? And we get the the broken pair repair. So it's, it's quite nice that it, it just, uh, it just works uh, by just trying all the things. And the trick here is, of course, I mean, we don't try every integer in scope. Uh, I mean, we don't try every integer, but because we kind of mind these integer from the uh, from the code base already, we could we could 
suggest them, right? So that, that works quite well. And now the third part is this uh, simple refinement. Because you notice in these, okay, so the first one, yeah, we have a property, but it's, it might as well have been a unit test. And here we, we're just using basically unit test, but here we actually have a property that's saying, okay, we have this F here, and it's saying folder minus one, but we want folder, fold L plus two, or fold R, right? So what we want is that we want uh, running, we want to run the function on a list, it should be the same as summing up the list and adding two. Okay, so for that, uh, I have a, a slightly different configuration just to make it uh, faster for the uh, demo. And then we run this on the simple refinement. And as, as before, it starts uh, off by describing the problem. Um, it takes a bit longer now because there are more kind of valid whole fits in scope that we're looking at. Uh, but, you know, as before, it runs quite fast and it finds the right solution, right? So if you replace this... Uh, expression with folder 2, it actually works, right? Okay, so that's the uh, the demo. Um, uh, and now I'm going to talk a bit about the, the empirical study that we did uh, to just to kind of see okay, how well does this pan out in practice, right? So uh, we had a couple of research questions, right? So uh, so how, how do we benefit? Do we benefit from using properties, right? Or, or and to what extent? Uh, and then, you know, with respect to that, like, you know, is it just a benefit in kind of solving more problems or is there a benefit in, uh, you know, do, do they improve the search in some some other way, right? And the third one, and this is actually what we were kind of targeting with this paper, right, is that uh, do we fix overfitting, right? So one thing that happens if you just have unit tests is that you can kind of come up with a fix that solves all the unit tests but it, it's not, it's very specific to those tests, right? And they don't, it doesn't really quite hold up to the general problem. Um, so, so we wanted to ask the question, okay, does using properties in automatic program repair, does it actually help with a, let me just check the time. Does it actually help, you know, with this overfitting problem, right? Okay, so for the first question, uh, we, 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 we ran a bunch of, uh, program repairs on, uh, we got data from uh, from a, a functional programming course at Chalmers. Uh, we ran a bunch of uh, uh, repairs on them. We got uh, uh, some solutions, right? Proper did find things that, that satisfied all the text, tests. And then we checked, okay, how many, like in different configurations, right? So we have uh, both unit tests and properties. We have just properties and we have just unit tests, right? Uh, and, and here's our result, right? So we have three different uh, algorithms that we're using. Uh, we have the exhaustive search, which just tries kind of everything in scope and then tries two of everything in scope uh, and it's quite slow. We have the genetic search uh, and then we have a random search, which just picks uh, a valid whole fit at random. Uh, and we can see that the random one didn't really work, didn't find any solutions. So uh, the exhaustive ones did find some solutions, but the genetic one uh, found a lot of solutions. Uh, and we can see that, you know, genetic search paired with properties worked quite well. Uh, but, it, you know, but in general, uh, uh, you know, it didn't, it didn't matter too much, right? We can see that for both, right, we, we didn't do as well as with just the properties. And the caveat here is, of course, um, that for both, I mean, we, we have more tests. We also have to satisfy the unit tests that were maybe not covered by the properties. And then we do quite well in the units, but we also have more overfits, right? And we address that in the third question. Uh, so, so the end result was, yeah, we didn't didn't really help with producing patches, right? But uh, let's look at like other benefits, right? So, for example, uh, the speed, right? So here's a, a graph that describes the the time to first result to kind of you know we ran the program, we saw well, like how long did it take to find a repair, right? And as we can see here that we have the genetic search in in in, in term uh, using the properties, and that was very fast at finding something that that worked right of the first repair. Um, so I think that's quite uh, that's quite nice, actually. Uh, and then you know for the yeah uh, yeah exactly. All right, and then the third one is a, a do we address the overfitting problem? Um, and then uh, to 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 look at this, we we had uh, me me and my uh, me and me and Leonard, we we kind of we, we generated a bunch of these fits, and then we we each looked at the uh, patches that were generated, like the fixes, 
and we had to say you know is this an overfit that sh or is it is it a good fit right and then uh, by by so we we, we use this kind of that uh, and uh, yeah that, that methodology and we found that uh, uh, we we actually we did reduce the overfit ratio by adding properties right uh so that that was quite nice okay but the uh, yeah, so that was uh, that was the the proper paper essentially, right? Um, and in the proper paper, I talk about this Haskell program coverage thing, right? Uh, so we, we count how many times this expression is elevated during execution, right? Uh, and then by applying property to a counterexample and instrumenting the resulting program, we can exactly see which expression in the module are evaluated in a failing execution, right? So the key word here is execution. Like we have to actually run the program in order to be able to fix it right we have to be able to to see what happens and what what is being evaluated when we we run it right and for that to be possible we have to be able to compile the program right we have to be able to uh, uh, you know compile the program and the thing is that if we have a type error in the program uh, we can't it, it doesn't compile right uh, even though that type error might not be relevant, like it, maybe it doesn't actually matter for the code to run, and it doesn't have any runtime impact, but but uh, but but it, it still fails to compile because of the type error, right? So to address this, uh, uh, me and and Augustine, so this is uh, actually we wrote this paper before the the Burbank paper, but in the, uh, it's a better story this way, right? So we wrote this uh, paper on uh, a short paper on weak runtime irrelevant typing for security. So the idea here is that there are some uh, uh, libraries in Haskell, like like Russo's uh, Mac library, which allows you to model the security uh, security properties in the type system, right? Uh, and it allows you to assign these labels to boxes, and it allows you to kind of say, okay, this is public information and this this is secret information. And then the whole type system uh, thing that it does is that it checks that you're not actually leaking secret data into public data, right? So you're not leaking passwords or anything like that, right? So to show off how, how that works, I'm just going to show you a, a demo right away, actually. So here we have a, a, a kind of a, a stripped down implementation of the Mac library, right? We have uh, labels, we have uh, the low label, which is public information, and we have a high label for secret information. And then we have this new type thing that wraps values with the label, right? And we have this class instance that makes sure that you can't use uh, uh, public data in the computation of private data, right? And then we we have some uh, functions that are based on this, right? We have this the labeled or function. Uh, we have these SIP functions that check. The first one checks, uh, you know, checks that the 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 security level of the output is is more than more than or equal to the uh, the security levels of the inputs, right? And this other SIP function, it actually checks uh, that the security levels are the same, right? So you, if you if you give it two lists, you want to be able to check that the the security level of them both are, are the same, and then you can return that same SIP list at the end. Uh, and then we try to use them in these bad functions. Uh, but what we're, the trick is that we're I mean we're, we're breaking the law, right? We're we're not using them correctly. We're trying to give we're trying to compute like public data using private data, right? Um, and so if we run this now, uh, let me, so, so now we don't have any plugin. We don't have this RIT plugin that we wrote, uh, uh, enable. So we, we try to run this, uh, and compile it. Right. And what course, what happens is that, you know, we were modeling these security types and then we're just violating the security and we get a lot of these, these type errors, right? Because I mean, that's what we want, right? We don't want to be able to compile the code with security in them. But the motivation here is, you know, we want to be able to run the code. We want to be able to see what's happening, even if we haven't right, quite figured out the security yet. We want to be able to look at it and say, okay, this works. Uh, we want to be able to play around with these values, right? So what I'm saying here is that um, we have, we want to be able to print out what the results are and then kind of look at the functional correctness, right? Uh, to see, you know, does the code work? And we want to be able to, you know, like in the context of program repair, we want to be able to run the program and see if it works. So what you can do now with this plugin is that you can uh, you enable it, right? And then we have a bunch of these uh, rules that we write to say, okay, we can 
discharge. We can make can make things equal. We can ignore some some constraints, and we can make uh, unlabeled things labeled and stuff like that. But I mean, the the main point uh, in the context of this list is that you know we have this code. We can run it, uh, and now it turns all the errors into warnings, right? So they're not type errors anymore. They're just warnings. Uh, they have these domain-specific uh, error messages that are relevant, right? And it's, yeah, I mean, it's saying that there's a there's a forbidden flow, right? You're using secret information in a public context, uh, but the trick is that we can still run the program. It still compiles, and crucially, because the, the changes or the type errors that we made were runtime irrelevant, uh, you know, the, the program still works. It's still, it's still, it doesn't crash, right? And that is what we we're kind of mainly looking for in these cases, right? And then the idea, of course, is, okay, we should be able to use this uh, to repair these type errors, right? And, and then kind of have a correct program that's maybe incorrect security-wise. And then we can kind of use that as an oracle to repair, uh, to, to repair the security of our program, right? Uh, but we haven't done that yet. But uh, uh, so this is just a building block. So, but the idea is okay. Sometimes you know we want to be able to make use of the information that we already have. But sometimes the information that you gave is kind of places too much constraints on uh, the compiler, and it can't satisfy them. And then we want to be able to kind of keep that information around, right? We want to be we want to have the security information here. But we still want the developer to be able to run the program and use the information, um, e even if even if they provided too much information, right? So this is this is still in the line of right, like let's make use of the information that we have, right? And also let's make sure that uh, you know you don't have to erase things just to make it compile, because then you know that that information is gone, right? We still want it around, but we want to allow running things like that. All right, uh, that's uh, yeah, and that's the future plans, right? We want to. We want to use this and marry this with the security fixes, and then uh, uh, I mean we have some more ideas about it, like proper and where we want to where we want to take that, and then uh, with a valid whole face, like how do we want to extend those? But I think uh, I think I've covered most of of, of what I uh, what I wanted to talk about in this list. All right, so uh, that's all for now, and uh, and, and thank you for listening to the list. All right.